Hello guys, Charles here and welcome back to my channel. So those are the sort of sounds we're going to be learning how to play today. And this is George Garzon's triadic chromatic approach. Now a couple of disclaimers just before we start. I'm not going to be sharing anything that's behind one of George's paywalls. There's very little that's behind the paywalls anyway. I have bought all of George's products, but most of it is the benefit of buying the product is the structure that you get. Um, he's very open about sharing his information. So you've, you'll find all this information online anyway, and I'm not going to share anything that's hidden behind a paywall. However, everything you need will be found within this video. Secondly, although the emphasis of this video is guitar, there's nothing too guitar specific in this video. So if you are a piano player, sax player, whatever, there should be something in here for you as well. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand the method just as clearly as all the guitarists. And finally, although this isn't a lick based video because we're trying to learn a concept here, the idea is you learn to develop these sounds for yourself. Any stuff that we talk about in this video and all of these slides that you'll see I'll put in a PDF which you can download down below in the description box. So hopefully you feel you've got a bit of a practice method out of this video rather than having to rewatch the video time and time again. Download that PDF and you've got all the information saved there. So George Garzone was described by Michael Brecker as the master of the saxophone and he's been teaching at Berklee College of Music since I think the late 70s so he's got a really long teaching career. George is known for his crazy outside playing and this approach was his way of working with students to develop that in their own playing. And George often describes this as a way to think beyond the changes, where we're not having to think every single chord passing by. We're just floating on top of the changes. The reason this works is because we're playing so many notes, we are bound to hit the correct notes within that phrase. So although we're playing as randomly as possible, a lot of correct notes that the current chord requires will be played. And that's all the ear really wants when we're playing over changes is to hear some correct stuff. And the random nature of this makes sure that those notes are there as well. And Garzone's method was so successful that it's been recommended by guys including Joe Lovano, Dave Liebman, and students such as Mark Turner and even Aiden Essen. So you've got a really, really strong cohort of people supporting this approach. So stick with it, give it the time it deserves, and you'll see the massive impact it can have on your playing. So there are three steps of the triadic chromatic approach. We're gonna outline them here and go through them in a lot more detail in a moment. The first is to play any triad. The second step is for that final note of the triad, we can go up or down a half step, i.e. up or down a fret as a guitarist. And the third step is that this note here that we've just landed on, this can be the root, third or fifth of a new triad. So let's just have it as the root, I'm currently on F. So we end up with this. And from there we just keep going back to step two, up or down a semitone from that last note. That becomes a note of the new triad, up or down a semitone, note of a new triad, and so on and so forth. So we're going to break those down, there's a tiny bit more to it than that, but that's the basic outline. Play a triad, move up or down a semitone from the final note, that becomes the root third fifth of a new triad. So to really get inside this approach, there's three variables that we need to practice independently and in different groups, which again we'll get to in one moment. The first of these variables is the triad type. The second of these variables is note order, not to be confused with inversion. And the third variable for guitarists is the caged position, which mostly negates the need for us to consider inversions, with one exception. So let's look at all these variables in order, starting with the triad types. So we have four basic triads in music. We have the major, minor, diminished and augmented. The major, minor and diminished are asymmetrical, which means that the intervals within them are varied. So the major we have the root, the third and the fifth. The minor we have the root, the flat third and the fifth. 
and the diminished, we have the root, the flat third, and the flat fifth. Remember, we're talking about diminished triad here, not the symmetrical diminished seventh chord. And then the only symmetrical triad we have is the augmented, which is the root, the third, and the sharp fifth. So the augmented is gonna give us different sounds and it's gonna be actually easier to play on the guitar as we'll see in a moment. But the other three are completely asymmetrical, which means we're gonna to have to study quite hard to learn where they live in various positions on the guitar. So our second variable is the triad note orders. Now you might be more comfortable with the term permutations. This is not to be confused with inversion. So I see this as being three different note orders in an ascending group and then their mirror image as descending. So you could think of this as six different ways that we can play the note to a triad if you want. I group them into pairs. So I think of it as three different ways. So you see we've got one, two, three, and three, two, one. So that could be C, E, G, or G, E, C. We are simply numbering the notes of the triad in order that they appear. So C, E, G, G, E, C. These are not scale degrees. One, three, two, which becomes two, three, one, and two, one, three, which becomes three, one, two. And you can see examples of the letters below each of those on the PDF. And the final variable, which we need to understand in a bit more detail before we can effectively use this approach, are the different triads where they live in the caged position. By using our caged position, we can mostly avoid having to think about inversions. Like I say, there is one exception to that, which we'll get to right at the end of this video. You can get great sounds even without considering that exception, which is why I'm leaving it till the end. So we've got our C major triads here. I've colored red is C position, yellow is A position, green is G position, dark blue, E position, light blue, D position, and back to red there in C position. Don't rely too much on those colors. They're just my approximation of what I consider to be each position. But people have different interpretations of what the A position is and what the E position is. So whatever makes sense to you, as long as you're consistent. And you'll see I've done this on all four triad types. We've got C minor triads, the C diminished triads, which you can see start to become symmetrical around the seventh fret, seventh or eighth fret there, and the C augmented triad, which you can see very clearly why this one is symmetrical uh, versus the others. So remember, those diagrams will be on the PDF. You have to know where those live in order to use this random triadic approach you need to know where the triads live themselves really, really confidently. So how do we practice this and start putting it all together? Well, all we need to do is practice the variables in different orders. So the way that I've decided to do this in this video is because we have three variables, we're gonna fix two of them and experiment with one of them. So we get really confident with that one that we're experimenting with, and then we swap these round in different groups. So I've come up with a line for each of these possible variables. Now remember, if we're fixing some variables in place, we're not really playing the approach properly. However, we're still gonna get some really cool sounds, and this is more of a practice room exercise rather than the final result. So this first line is gonna be a fixed triad type. So we're just gonna use majors in this particular example, but of course you can fix the triad to any of the four. I'm doing a fixed note order. So I'm using the ascending and descending pair when I say note order. So I'm, for this example, using one, two, three, and three, two, one. So I'm only either going straight up or straight down. And that's great because it means that when we get to the top or the bottom of the guitar, we can change direction, but still be using the same pairing. In this instance, I'm gonna be experimenting with the caged position. So you should see lots of different caged shapes going by, but only major triads and only either ascending or descending. One, two, three, three, two, one. That sounds like this. So I'm not gonna break down that entire lick, but just to give you a rough idea of where these cage positions are coming from, we start here three, five, five, which is a C major played with the A shape. That shape there, which many of you will be familiar with. Remember, if, you're not, if you can't see that that's an A shape, you need to spend more time practicing your caged position triad types. And then go down a semitone, Six, seven, which gives me the C shape. Something like an E chord with a C shape. And then go 
down a semitone again. And that is still a C shape. Up a semitone. A flat C, E flat there. Using kind of an E shape. Again, consensus is out on exactly what's an E shape, but it comes from this. So hopefully you get the idea. We're just merging between different cage shapes. So the next variable we can practice would be fixing the triad type, experimenting with the note order, and fixing the caged position. So if you were a bit unclear on that first example, now things have swapped, you might be able to see it a little bit more clearly. So again, to keep things simple, I've fixed the triad type to major. So these are all major triads, as you can see by the labeling on the example. I fixed the position to the C position of the cage system. So that would be this shape here. So I'm only gonna be using those shapes, but of course I can be moving them around. And my variable is going to be the order I play those notes in. So rather than just going, go or am I go or different orders so the lick sounds like this so again just to break that line down a little bit for you just to give you some understanding of what was going on I start here on the bottom notes of this C shape I then go down a semitone, which is what we have to do. And then rather than just descending through those same notes in the same order, I just jumbled the order up. I then use that same shape again in a different order. So you see, these first ideas are just the same shape, showing all the permutations. shape basically up to that same shape again variable note order so on and so forth and the final one would be to experiment with the triad type but fix the note order and fix the cage position so for my example i'm fixed to the ascending or descending note order again so just one two three three two one this time i'm using the g position of the cage shape just to make it a little bit different for us here again your interpretation of g might vary that's absolutely fine sounds like this Now in your own practice, you can then experiment with two at a time and have one fixed. So for example, you might experiment with the triad type and the note order, but in a fixed cage position. You might experiment with the triad type and the cage position, but in a fixed note order. And finally, you might experiment with the note order and the cage position, but using a fixed triad type. So by focusing on all the individual variables individually, by just choosing one to experiment with, you increasing your confidence and you're seeing patterns on the guitar which otherwise you might have uh, missed because there was just too much going on. And it is a really tough approach this. I've been working on this one seriously for a couple of weeks now. It's something I've known about for a long time. I've got a few other licks on the channel built off this approach. But something I've been taking seriously for a couple of weeks and it's slow going but it's also quite impressive how quickly you do start to pick up a few lines here and, and they will find their way into your playing so stick with it but practice smart so finally we've got this one rule that technically we do need to be careful of so the only rule of the triadic chromatic approach so we know our method by now we play any triad we go up or down a half step from the final note and this new note becomes the root third or fifth of a new triad however if we choose the same triad type and inversion we've got to play a different note order to avoid repetition. So let's look at some examples of this. So in this instance, the red arrow is bad news and the green arrow is good news. So remember the same triad type and inversion, we've got to play them in a different note order to avoid repetition. So if I go C, E, G, and I go up to an A flat, I can't 
just play an A flat triad, A flat, C and E flat. Because that's repetitive. But I can play a C triad to an A flat triad, but play them in a different note order. In this instance, one, three, two. C, E, G. Problem solved, Re repetition gone. Another example, this time let's say we go down a semitone from C, E, G, and we're on an F sharp or a G flat chord. So again, I can't just play a straight F sharp triad, C, E, G, F sharp, A sharp, C sharp. But that sounds like this. That's bad news, that's repetitive. But again, instead of going one, two, three, I can go one, three, two. You will eventually just do this automatically. Just recording those examples there, I accidentally did it correctly when I was trying to demonstrate the wrong example because I've just drilled this into my head. There's only one way of doing it and that's rather than going one, two, three, you go one, three, two, if you want that one to be the root of the chord. So that's the whole approach. And just to finish with, I thought there's a couple of points to make about the triadic chromatic approach, which might be useful. The first is Garzone talks a lot about use it or lose it. He says himself how this is really hard. Remember, this is the guy who's considered the greatest saxophone player of all time by many. And he says it's hard. He says if he doesn't practice this, he loses it. So it, often in a clinic, he'll say, oh, I've had to be practicing for a couple of weeks to get ready for this clinic because he knows people are going to ask him about this approach. And if he hasn't been really thinking about it, he can lose it. So we've got to really stick with this and be patient with yourself. If it's hard for Garzone, it's going to be very hard for us. So the second thing is you've got to get the sound in your ear first and get it under your fingers second. As with any approach, it can become a bit, I don't know, methodical. You've got to train your ears to hear these sounds. So a couple of ways of doing that might be to try singing this before you play it, which is really, really hard. But if you sung a couple of these every day, in a, in a few months, your ear would be phenomenal, especially if you're using solfege, which um, I certainly can't do. But try singing it. Also, a bit of listening as well, which I'll recommend in a moment. Thirdly, practice different combinations and don't force it into your playing. So remember, we're working on this in the practice room. We've got all these different variables and we're training our ear is the goal here. The idea, as with any approach, is for it to eventually organically come out in our playing. If we force this out on the bandstand, it can just sound a bit contrived and a bit weird. You force it out in the practice room, you force yourself to use these ideas and you maybe play over backing tracks, force these sounds out and they can be a bit hit or miss. But the idea is that eventually with a better ear through training and by practicing these all the time, these little ideas will eventually just slip out in your playing as things do in your playing already, which once upon a time you couldn't do, now they just happen automatically. The same will happen with this approach. Stick with it, be patient. So finally, check out some George Garzone. Chris Crocco is probably the best guitarist to hear this approach from. He was a direct student at Berkeley of Garzone, so he learned it straight from the horse's mouth. His playing is unbelievable. He's, he's got a ridiculously few number of subscribers on YouTube. So go over, subscribe to Chris Crocker and check out his playing. It's ludicrous. He also plays in the band called Sons of Garzone. And they're all guys who have either worked really closely with Garzone or learned from him, students of Garzone's. So you'll hear different instrumentalists within that band developing the triadic chromatic approach. Just hearing those different sounds can be really, really useful to, again, getting the sound in your ear but coming from different instruments. So if you made it this far, well done. If you found this useful, please do give it a like, subscribe, ding that notification bell, and share with any of your friends who could do with some outside color in their play. Thank you for all the kind words. It's really nice to be back on YouTube. I'm still not 100%, but I'm gonna try and get back to my usual uploading schedule now. And I hope you're all doing very well yourselves, getting plenty of practice in, and I very much look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers. Roll up, roll up. Me in bed, a story you'll never forget. A drip, drip, a drowning in debt. Now you can't buy your way out. And I heard you find it difficult to go.